Hmm? Oh, hello there. Didn't see you coming in. <laughs> Might I ask what brings you to the archive today? Oh, it's night already, is it? I lost track again. Not that it matters. What about day and night? Ever since our assistant decided to run off and chase their dreams as an adventurer, I've been working for two. Three, if you count our rather laissez-faire head archivist. Oh, he's around, just rather, well, to put it frankly, quite drunk. I would honestly inquire more into it, but... Seeing just how much work needs to be done, I wouldn't blame him. No, nothing of the sort. I don't drink that kind of drink. But tea and coffee? Oh, yes. Oh, seven hells do I have my fill. Jasmine tea, green tea, black tea, elderberry tea infused with... Oh dear, my sincerest apologies, traveler. You're here for a book. Are you? Do you have any idea on what you're looking for? What do we have? <laughs> I'll have you know that this is more than some small corner shop or hole in the wall bookstore. This is an archive filled with a veritable wealth of knowledge. Centuries of study, stories, and so much more. If you could imagine it, there will be something here for you. I am quite confident in the Archive's halls and their innate ability to draw you in and lead you to something interesting. <laughs> Perhaps not as outwardly interesting as being out there as an adventurer, but exciting and intriguing in its own right. Out there in that vast, spectacular world, songs sung and teas tasted. Uh, you're right, but... Perhaps ales and wines and spirits of that nature. But nonetheless, spectacular things wait around every corner. The same goes for this fortress of knowledge. Those same battles, dreams, and hymns sung of heroes all exist right here. Forever immortalized in text and art, in runes and stone and all from the comfortable, safe, cozy halls of this archive. Oh, I'm nothing against adventurers. <laughs> My apologies if I came off as abrasive. I just envy them. You wouldn't happen to be an adventurer, would you? You are? Well, how exciting. You must regale me in tales of your adventures. Hmm... You may be happy to now, but know that telling me stories of your travels will be at your peril. I'm not the type to cast such foul magics. I just ask a lot of questions. It can be rather... dull. Lonely, even, being a lone soldier waging war on thousands of collections of tomes. You'd be happy to anyways? <laughs> that would be splendid. Ah, uh, but first, your book. Apologies, I got excited. Is there anything in particular that you're looking for? Recently, we received a massive collection from Jakal on how to brew tea. No? That's a shame. Honestly, you struck me as a tea drinker, and I was searching for a reason to finally get to those. God, how I've looked forward to them. For... Hmm. Tempus Priesens. Oh, it's been weeks, has it? Oh, one day. Sweet books filled with promises of better tea. Ah, one day. Well, I haven't gotten to them yet, since there's a specific way that things must be done here. And I have... A very particular way of sorting, cataloging, and storing knowledge. Start from the oldest batch and work your way to the earliest. Unless special circumstances arise, and they often do. 
Though, at this rate, that seems to be something that is most akin to the never-ending battle of Sisyphus. Well, right now I'm going through the... Uh, lofty life of Lillian von Lindenberg, an autobiography. As there are dry spells in your questing, so are the terribly tedious and downright terrible pieces of work, if you could call it that. This one in particular is just as the title entails. The life of someone born with several silver spoons in their gaping maw. That may seem spiteful, but spend several hundred years reading any number of these in order to properly catalog them, and you'll quickly find yourself wishing that the world's aristocrats would stop writing. Well, paying people to write their autobiographies of embellished deeds. Oh my goodness, I really am tired, aren't I? <laughs> well, if you don't have any particular books in mind, perhaps I can help you find one myself. Of course, I have all the time in the world. Please, if you'll just bear with me and come this way, we can start with the more bombastic tales of adventurers. Recountings of battles with dragons, demons, anything you could imagine. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, oh dear. I always forget that wall's there. Well, traveler, it is dimly lit here to prevent the more delicate books from fading. But you see, I can't really... well... see. I'm blind. I know, a blind archivist. It must seem rather stupid, impossible even, but with a little help from my trusty flask of tea and a spell, I can see just well enough to do my work, only temporarily, but it is quite nice seeing what I'd normally just be feeling for. If you just give me a moment. Ah. <laughs> Still better. Oh, far too better. <clears throat> and there it is again. The blurs and shadows that are my world now, albeit a bit clearer. Um, well, I lost my sight a hundred and some odd years ago when I was, uh. <sighs> when I was still out there in that beautiful world adventuring to... To sum it up for you, I was chasing ancient ways to more efficiently store knowledge and to better understand this realm's link to magic. I was trying to... I sought powers that were beyond my control. Made deals with... with people that I shouldn't have. And in my search, I paid the price. I wanted to see the world, to gaze upon greatness and follow other great adventurers on quests, to maybe someday become one myself. But that toe, that sacrifice I made, it cost me my eyesight. Now I can see but glimmers of the world around me. And even then, only with the aid of magic and through years of practicing as an apothecary. Yes, how perceptive of you. The brew I make, it helps aid my vision further. Even still, it's barely enough without casting light upon the books I read just to make out the letters. <laughs> no harm in asking. Questions bring answers and results, though oftentimes more than not, those results are less than satisfactory. Ah, but here we are. The adventurer's tales from Grinfleur to Blackwater. If you go down this aisle, you'll find more tomes from Jakal and beyond. No, really. I'm fine. Hmm, well, what are your thoughts? Perhaps a bit 
too bombastic, hmm? Well, that's quite all right. This opposite row holds folklore and tales. Bedtime stories, if you should be interested in those. Again, all of them from being all across Circo Turnum. What do I suggest? Oh, well, that's like asking a dragon which gold coin in her hoard is her favorite. This is truly a magnificent hoard, and... Oh, my, my apologies. <laughs> I'm rambling again. Well, if you'd like, I could read you a little bit of one I frequented when I needed to rest. It's this one right here. Would you like to sit with me for a while? <laughs> I know the book is still locked, silly. I just remember it by heart. Well, are you ready? Hmm, been forever since I've read for someone. This one is called Sagittarius Parvas. The Little Archer. In former times when the world was still young, there on the golden plains of Elton lay a great city, with high stone walls and banners that hung proudly. The people were strong, and their lord was just. They had water and fresh fish from the river that ran through the city, rich veins of gold from the snow-capped mountains off in the northern distance and wheat a plenty in those fields that surrounded the city. The area surrounding the keep was fortified, having withstood the test of over a hundred years of war, and the fey wilds and the demons that walked the plains before them. The palace's halls were a beautiful white marble with gold trim, vast courtyards hosting a variety of flowers from across Taran. Within all this beauty lay a great sickness, the fair lord of Elton in his crusade against the hordes of the north had succumbed to a grave injury on the field of battle. Sickness had taken to his wound, and though many tried, none could succeed in healing the cursed festering mutilation that he'd been subjected to. The fair lord put out a summons to adventurers from all across the land. From the murky boglands and their raiders to the high peaks of Holdfast, he tasked them all with finding the heart of a great stag, a demigod of the golden plains whose blood ever pumping from the sacred vessel could cure him of his affliction and save his life. Sellswords and saints alike took up arms and stalked down the golden stag. Though the creature was elusive, Eventually the forests were burned, the fields salted, all in search of the cure. The stag was found in the northern plains, but couldn't be felled. Countless adventurers attempted again and again, but each fell, one by one. The land was soaked in blood. Trees began to wither. The very streams and lakes that once sustained the land became murky and pestilent as the golden stag retreated deeper into the woods. Amongst the heroes that fell in search of the great wealth promised to whoever brought the fair lord his only hope, there was a young archer, Parvos, aptly named, stalked the beast through the woods alongside many others. Though not strong, the boy wished to become a better man and sought the beast not only for the wealth, but for self-fulfillment, for his family. Seeing it as his great calling, his ascension to become something better. Coming from a small hunting village lost to memory, he had nothing to lose, but everything to gain. Time and time he found the golden creature, standing so tall that its antlers reached above the trees. Those piercing blue-green eyes that surveyed the dying land around it met his own. And over and over, the boy knocked his bow and let his arrows fly towards the beast, but none met their mark. 
Always thinking ahead, yet always a step behind, he grew weary as he chased the stag across Terran, through frigid mountain passes and across fjords, through treacherous bogs and dense forests, until one night he found the stag sleeping amidst a storm. How peacefully it lay there as he drew back his arrow. He perched up on rock face and could see it there in all its beauty. Golden hide, slow breaths as its chest rose and fell. Harvos's own breath faltered as he aimed at the creature's head. Just as he was to let the arrow fly, he slipped, the rocks he was perched upon crumbling away as he fell a great height. Seconds passed, more than a few before he found himself at the bottom of the crag. With blurry vision, he looked around, still desperately reaching for his bow despite the pain that held every fiber of his being. Scanning feverishly for the beast of promise, the golden stag, his sight began to fail him as his breaths quickened, the blood dripping from his body mingled with the rain and mud beneath him. With broken bones and torn flesh, the pain was too much to bear. He crawled towards the forest, where he could see the faint glimmer of the stag's golden hide shimmering in the moonlight. Growling in pain, rolling to his side to draw the bow back one last time. The pain then finally took his strength, the bow falling to the grass along with the rest of him. Dreams. Memories flooded him in the darkness that swirled so tumultuously in his mind. Memories of his hunt for this beast, the hardships he'd endured, the things he'd sacrificed. But he shoved it all aside, as within this dream he still chased that glimmer, now just a dying light in the distance that too faded to nothing. It wasn't until dawn had come that he opened his eyes again. Parvos's eyes were still clouded, his head throbbed, and his entire body fought against him as he crawled towards the tree line where he'd last seen them. He slid along the slick ground for what seemed like an eternity, until he could move no more. With ragged breaths, he lay his back against a willow tree by a small stream that trickled alongside it. Parvos's teeth gritted as he clutched at the grass, tears streaming down his face. There he sobbed quietly in the silence of the forest. With only the wind as company, he lurched to his side, gazing at his reflection in the stream. The boy had long since faded away, where youthful eyes so full of pride and bravery had dulled the crow-footed weary eyes of a man who had ventured his entire life in search of something he could never reach, the golden stag of promise, so close yet unattainable. His brown hair had turned stark white. The supple sun-bronzed skin scarred and battered beyond recognition. He had fought many hard battles, overcoming insurmountable odds, saved hundreds of lives during his lifelong quest of hunting down the stag. It was never his goal, but he did it anyways, much to his own risk, much to his own detriment. All that heroism, all those roads taken and those victories ending here. The tears fell now as he felt his strength draining, blood seeping from his broken body into the stream. Then he heard something in the underbrush behind him. Who's there? he asked tiredly. There was no response, only the sound of brush moving and twigs snapping underfoot as a being emerged with a groan from the tall blades of grass beside him. It was enormous, made of twisted vines and branches, arms of oak and horns of ironwood. 
Its face was adorned with a white painted mask that housed two pale blue eyes that pierced through the hollow of its head towards Pavos. Who are you? Pavos asked. The creature's frame creaked and moaned as the sound of wood grinding against itself gave way to deep, melodious words echoing from within the beast's helm. I am, and you are a hunter, yes. With every word the creature spoke, the ground itself seemed to shake. Not a hunter, a fool, Pavos replied through shallow breaths. His eyes tiredly studying and gazing at the wooden creature that had lain down in the grass beside him. Are you death? He asked. I am many things. Life and death are only parts of what I am. Only parts of what we all are. Of what we become. The creature replied. What brings you this deep into the woods? This place isn't for the living. I sought a prize, a golden stag. With it, I could be someone. I could live comfortably and provide the same to those I loved. I'd be praised and rewarded. From where do you hail? I... I can't remember. I suppose it doesn't matter now. I'm dying. Do you have any regrets? Many. What would you do if you were given another life? I don't think that I'd want one. But if I had one, then I would see the world without a single thought of that stag. I would try to be at peace with who I was and enjoy the fruits of what I'd become. <laughs> I hope that I'd be good. Parvos's head lolled to one side as he dropped the bow from his hands onto the grass, his eyes half open, staring out sightlessly at the stream. The creature stirred, its lumbering form now towering over Parvos. It lowered its wooden body towards the ground, the white masked head close to his, and with this it whispered in speech lost to the ages unheard by any but the forest. From Parvos's body lifted a small, dimly glowing wisp, which found its home inside the beast as it breathed in the tiny fragment of soul. Atop the branched back of the beast was a fledgling robin, still in its nest, unable to fly. The creature began to move, lumbering its way deeper into the forest. Stirring the robin along, the robin's eyes glowing, pale blue. And that is the end of chapter one. Would you like for me to continue to the next? Yes, this one is a tad bit more somber, but I think it's quite beautiful nonetheless. Perhaps I envy our little archer's second chance to live their dream. <laughs> I'm not so hopeless that I've lost my dream. I've just... I've just had to change it. To better suit what I'm capable of now. Now my mind is set towards helping those afflicted with blindness. Especially those without the capacity to see as I can through magical means. That way... Even if you can't be in the adventures, perhaps you can still revel in the joys and hardships that come with them regardless. All deserve the right of knowledge and easy access to it. I wish to continue studying as I did before I lost my vision, and find better ways to disseminate stories and art and everything in between to those that find themselves in a state such as I. Even if it means spending my life reading every scroll in this archive so that, perhaps someday, one may hear the book through my words recorded in arcing glyphs. I think... I think that perhaps that would be enough. That like Parvos, I too could do something good with this new life I've been given. 
regardless of the difficulties. But that's enough of that. The next chapter? <laughs> yes, I'm excited. It's one of my favorite folk tales. Hmm, well, I'm glad that you're enjoying it. Chapter 2 Flight. The air was scented with the fragrance of pine and oak. A little robin flying overhead above the dense canopy, singing its song for the great beast below, the one that had breathed life into it once more. On the forest floor, thumping its way through the underbrush, the oaken creature listened, its eyes drawn skyward to catch glimpses of their new friend, new 